Hi, Terry Allen here, Inventing Guitar Mathematics, and in this lecture I'm going to consider the open D minor tuning with the key of C and the key of D, and I'm intonating everything at this standard D2 intonation, so I'm going to talk about uh, E minor, open E minor, and open D minor as if they're the same tuning, and I kind of go back and forth uh, between the naming the pitches, though it, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes they'll call this open E minor, sometimes they'll call it open D minor. Now open D minor key of C is an important Beatles key and I want to show some songs that show kind of how they developed this key over a period of time. So the key of C is the one that has its tonic here at the 10th fret. It's the 6th chord, so A minor, the 7th fret. The 4th chord is the F at the 3rd fret. And the 5th chord is the uh, G here at the 5th at the fret. And you keep your eye on the uh, augmented, which is a, a you know, signal to return back to the tonic. And then finally got the second chord, the two chord, in the open position or at the 12th fret. Finds the key of C that shake of B, the two five one and uh, I'm not going to play the uh, Bonnie lies over the ocean, but that kind of shuffle is is a natural for C. home is an interesting modulation because they're they're uh, switching the A chord from the minor to the major from the major to the minor whoa whoa whoa
hold your hand it first appears in the ATV sheet music in the key of C and it goes like this. Oh yeah, I'll tell you something. I think you'll understand when I say that something. I wanna hold your hand. Let me be your man. No, please say to me, I wanna hold your hand. Now let me hold your hand. I wanna hold your hand. And when I touch you, I feel a happy inside. It's such a By the time it comes out on the record, it's in a different key, and um, it, to match this, I really should be playing an electric guitar on uh, open E to, to match the record key, but I'm going to play it uh, in, without a capo because it's a little bit easier. I tried to telephone, 
they said you were not I saw you walk through your door I nearly died I nearly died Cause you walk hand in hand With another man Man in my place If I were you Now there's an obscure song called I'm in Love that the Beatles have sheet music for but they never recorded or succeeded to get anybody else to record it. But I just want to point out that uh, the progression is somewhat like Stairway to Heaven and I don't actually know how the song goes but the chords are... augmented or E E augmented if you like C D F minor C and then an even more obscure one and somewhat uncharacteristic uh, is this one the love of the love each time I look into your eyes and I see that heaven lies And I see the love of the love Second time Now, for Rollover Beethoven, you have this, I think they recorded it in the key of D, and it's probably like in the Chuck Berry sheet music in C, and then I figure, well, he's playing it in open E, so then I would put the C here, which is kind of a nice middle position, and the four chord here is matching, so you can have a shuffle, matching shuffle on
stops, the Chuck Berry double stops are almost the same because they are the same on the top three strings, but then when you get to the bottom strings, you have this kind of crossover. So in the pentatonic scale, you, you, you recognize the top three strings as being the same as in standard. And then you look at the bottom three strings as though they're in drop D. So what happens is it's like the two are connected by just one corner. So if I go up like this. It's two, two notes on each string. And then this one only has one note because otherwise I'll be repeating one of the notes. So it's got this kind of funny hourglass shape. And uh, when you play the Chuck Berry double stops, it's weird because you, when you, it's always annoying when you cross between the third and the fourth string, and the, the notes are not where you expect them in the standard position. So what I think is the Beatles recorded this in like a open D or possibly open C playing it at this fret, the 8th fret, and then they speeded it up so that the, uh, the key appears to be D. And then they, they're playing really fast and they have this kind of a compression on the sound that just sounds like, you know, it's a superhuman guitar playing. And uh, so that, I think, is a trick where they're uh, using the intonation of the guitar in a lower, uh, lower pitch and then they're speeding up the pitch in the recording. Now, there's a mathematical principle called forgetting the musical key. And it, it means if you change the pitch of a recording, then the original pitch is lost because the new recording doesn't depend on the old one in any way, so there's no way to recover the key. But in guitar, that's not true because you can recover, you know what the, the position on the guitar is. And so you, you have information about what the guitar key is, even if you have lost the... Uh, the, the original key, the intonation of the guitar can go up and down and you can still recognize which key is being used. So George Harrison's something is, is uh, clearly an, an open D minor or possibly open E minor uh, song and so in the key of C which matches the observed uh, key in, in this tuning you have use of this C chord, then it's, it's a voice leading progression, C major 7, C7, a little bit, little bit hard to play, then the F, the walk down, D, this is D7 in the music, To that that same old descending my mi my mi minor progression a minor e plus a minor seven a minor six and then and that that order of those chords it's 
F, it could go down to but it sounds more interesting of Now there's another version, it's a kind of one of these sister key things where you have the, the C version, but you also have a strong version in the key of D. And that one goes like this. richer and and uh, so he, it may be that he's got his guitar tuned down to C and so that um, the key of D appears to be the key of C. Let's all get up and dance to a song that was a hit before your mother was born. Before she was born a long, long time ago. Your mother should know It's a matter of mathematic proof because you can prove that I'm wrong by finding a better version. But if you can find a be better version, then that's proof of the best way to play the song 
if if not the way that the Beatles played it, at least the mathematically the best way to play it. So that kind of proof is something that it, it, it distinguishes human intelligence from machine intelligence because humans understand music naturally, they understand it intuitively, they understand it empirically, or they understand it by instruction. But the machine, the guitar as an intelligent machine, understands music as a matter of mathematic proof. For example, the machine knows when a pitch is true to the tuning. It knows when a pitch is true to the octave. And so the kind of intelligence that the guitar has, where it's focused on certain tunings that are optimal, has come about from many, many experiments that people have performed on guitar, looking for the best way to play things. And after a while, experiments don't produce any new tunings or any new useful keys because everyone is already using the best keys that they can find. So this is different from empirical because if you invented a guitar and you tried to find the right tuning, you, you would never come up with open D minor. But if, but if you test all of the different tunings, then what you'll see is that open D minor is a very powerful tuning. It's certainly one of the very best. And there are not going to be any new guitar tunings that have this general utility that are going to be discovered. Now you might develop uh, eccentric guitar tuning for an unusual use, but the test of a tuning really is whether you can play with your band that wants to play songs in all kinds of different keys. Because I always find that like in open G minor or dad gad, you're, you're limited to certain keys and you, it, it becomes very difficult to play in those other keys that are not favored. But in open D minor you have a broad range of keys. You have a very high density of chords and you have chords that are harmonically correct. And so there's lots of reasons why you don't want to change the guitar tuning because all guitarists, including me, hate to change guitar tunings. And we have a list of reasons why we're not going to change tunings and most of them are bad. For example, people tell me, well, you might break a string, your guitar won't stay in tune, it's too hard to remember stuff, it might get confused, you have to learn all over again, and anyway, it doesn't make any difference because as long as you play the same notes, it doesn't matter what tuning or key you're in. But that's ridiculous because it implies that every way of playing guitar is just as good as every other way, when in fact, there's one best way. And so that's what I'm trying to show here is the best way to play Beatles music. The most important key in open D minor is obviously D, but what's interesting is that it's D major that we love so much and not really so much D minor. And for the the for for blues, the open D minor key of D is can only be compared to open G key of G and open D major tuning key of D. Now those are the, you know, the, the positions that are so highly expressive, but, and, but also pretty difficult to learn. And it's the first key that uh, we all learn in these tunings, and, but it also is um, one which is kind of a telltale uh, kind of cliche to it that can be um, sort of annoying and you have to explore the kind of the higher reaches of that tonal domain. But I want to start with um, 
a couple of songs to give a context for this key and this tuning. And uh, a good example is Hey Joe by Jimi Hendrix, which goes like this. from the record and you, you're looking at it from the standpoint of standard tuning because the tuning is, is a point, it's a point of view. So from that perspective you hear that first note and you recognize it as a unison lick, a lick where the same note, the same pitch is played on two different strings and they're not in phase so that you get that kind of a, a electric sound. And unison licks don't occur on the piano because on the piano each, each pitch has one key and so you don't have any place where you can play the same note in two different positions. But on the guitar, almost every note has a unison lick available. Now there's a couple of exceptions. The first notes here up to there don't have any other note on the guitar with the same pitch. They're solitary and so they don't have a unison lick. And then there's another set up here at the top that don't have uh, uh, an uh, uh, unison available, but all the other ones have it. So when you hear that, and you hear it, Hendrix is playing in an E flat, I'm, I'm playing it in D here, but Hendrix is playing in an E flat, so in standard tuning you figure, well, he's just slightly detuned. And so that sets that you recognize that as the tonic of the pentatonic scale that, fo that follows. Now when you run into these two strings, they're the ones that are different from standard. The other four are the same. And so you have a real mimic situation where you can think he's playing in standard and when the notes fall on these two strings that are not tuned to standard, you just kind of fudge the notes because it's pentatonic and uh, you, can, you can usually find the notes to play and they're just not in the right order. But then the problem is you come down on the F chord to the D and that you hear that D clearly so you know he's not in standard tuning. So then you have this problem because if this is the tonic E here coming down on the tonic there then the top and bottom strings have to be tuned to the same note. So that leads you to the conclusion, well, it, it maybe it's in drop detuning, but then you still have the problem that this, this would be E and this would be D, and that's a cross note effect where these, you see these top strings as standard and then you see the bottom as drop D, but it's shifted over to. So it's not, it's not in double drop D, but it's not in open G, and then you have, it's not in D major because you have this open position D flat chord. Where the chords move up like in a, in a fifth, uh, in a cycle of fifths. And so those, those chords rock. And, um, then on top of it, you have this, this like a signature um, bass lick. And the problem here is you can play this in standard tuning, 
but you, you, the, the spacing of the chromatic uh, bass runs doesn't work out right. Whereas here you have like the bass runs come off of each of the chords. B flat, F, C, G, back to the D. So when what happens in standard tuning is you can play those chords, but the, you have the, the... And then instead of having the next one right underneath it, it's shifted up here. And so it doesn't make as much sense as it does in this tuning. Another song I want to mention for context is The Cross and Evil Blues by Reverend Gary Davis. And I'm a great fan of Gary Davis, which I think is the most important American guitarist. And he left, left a great legacy of guitar music as transcribed by Stefan Grossman. And I'm, I'm kind of a mail-order graduate of the school of Stefan Grossman. But one thing that concerns me is he seems to be following in the same trap of a lot of music publishers of representing everything in standard tuning as if maybe the uh, buy audience doesn't want to buy music that's not in standard tuning or more likely I think it's just kind of it takes more work to figure out which the proper tuning is and so I think that um, it would be academically interesting if Stefan Grossman would clarify which of those uh, Gary Davis transcriptions he actually learned at the hands of the master and, and which ones he merely transcribed from tapes that, he, that they uh, made over at Gary Davis's house back in the 60s. Uh, because what I think is, it's clear that Gary Davis knew open G and open D and open D minor. And um, so, it's just really hard for me to believe that he, he was such a blues master and he only used standard tuning. Just like I, I can't believe that the, the Beatles loved guitar and they only used one tuning. That just doesn't make any sense to me. this A7 and it gives a blues in open D minor tuning the a characteristic dominant sound because it's actually an A7 sus4 it's an important general rule that the sus4 chord is in the 7 family 7 dominant 7 family chord uh, and so what that means is that you have the A7 here with a D note in it. It's got the C sharp, but it also has these open D notes. Either here, this chord is shaped like a D chord in standard tuning, but it's, it's moved over to these strings and up two frets. But it, you can kind of use it like a D chord. And the other one is this one. It's a two finger A7, which has got that uh, sus4, third, sus4, seven, tonic, 
sus4 and it's kind this cord is kind of just dying to have the uh, the sus4 resolve up to the to the fifth so it, it, it really wants to have an E note added to make that chord complete so that chord is a, a, has a really un, unique sound and obviously this part That's the same in either standard or in an open, in, in, you know, to match the record, you would be open E minor. But um, so the, the top strings are the same, the bottom string is the same, and it's really hard to see how it can make that much difference if these two strings are tuned differently. But in those, those marvelous bass runs, they, um, what happens is when you go from Stefan Grossman's version in standard tuning to open E minor, you gain a lot of open string notes because it, you obviously you want this, this bass string to be on the tonic, but what's not so obvious is you also want this, the, the second bass string to be on the fifth of the chord, and that increases the efficiency of the bass run. So the the problem you have in standard with B7 and some other uh, technical points makes the standard tun tuning version of that song much more difficult to master. And I think if you compare it to the record and you know the open E minor version, you'll see that, that that's clearly what Gary Davis is using. And there's a funny story about uh, Stefan Grossman who was trying one day to get Gary Davis to play in a different tuning. And Gary Davis said he knew like Candyman in 18 different versions. So there aren't 18 different keys and enough time signatures to make that up. So I think it's, it's pretty clear that Davis played Candyman in several different tunings. And on that day, uh, Stefan pushed Gross. Uh, I mean, Stefan pushed Gary Davis to play in a different tuning, and Davis whipped out this tuning as a derivative of open D with the top string tuned differently, and he played something that he knew by heart. So what I think is that for some reason Gary Davis had settled in on standard tuning, which he played very well, and he used to teach students perhaps because he thought that's what they, they wanted to know or he had some uh, unusual ideas about uh, playing blues and gospel music. Uh, but I noticed there's a new autobiography of Gary Davis out, uh, Say No to the Devil. There's a detailed discussion of uh, Davis's repertoire and uh, based, I guess, a lot on Stefan Grossman's archives. But it makes the same mistake as Walter Everett's because it never once considers how Gary Davis tuned his guitar. And that creates a, an impression that uh, he, he used only standard tuning. Um, how do you know? Because that's what the published music shows. So turning to the Beatles now, uh, this is an iconic expression. <laughs> this chord is that you have the usual D chord that you slide up the neck like in standard tuning or drop D, but you're picking up the uh, third 
on the fourth string, you're picking up the F sharp, the third of the chord, and you're moving that up over these, these open bass strings. Very Beatleoid kind of chords. See, that's the simplest way to do it. It's still kind of hard, but it has that um, kind of a moving uh, voice leading line in it that's a little bit elemental, but you have the D chord and then it walks up from the fifth. And that's an unusually difficult figure for beat music. It sort of has like a classical kind of uh, technique to it. Now this one is, just shows like the uh, the shameless use of the diatonic chord progression. Second part, I can't believe it's happening. I can't conceive of And what's interesting in that song, I think, is the way they're using that. E augmented chord in the tonic position to move up to the four chord, whereas usually you see it like on the uh, fifth chord and moving back to the tonic. So that's a, a little bit of their uh, variation of their use of the augmented chord. I've been told when a boy is a girl. Take a trip around the world. Bop, bop, shwam, bop, bop, shwam, bop, shwam, bop, bop, shwam, bop, shwam. Boys, 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 where you talk about boys? Where you talk about boys? Oh, you talk about boys. Bundle 
on the record, and uh, there's a nice version in Open D in the key of F, but there's also this version, and they, they seem to be uh, both pretty solid, so it may be that, that um, both tunings are used in the recording, and they just, just can't separate them, or at least I think that Beatles are kind of aware that the song can be played in different keys and they're kind of evaluating which one is the best for them. Can't buy me love. friend if it makes you feel all right I'll get you anything my friend if it makes you feel all right I don't care too much for the money can't buy me love simple chords really rock because uh, that seems to be a characteristic of Lennon that he he can tell which figures uh, on the guitar are you know iconic uh, and can be used even though they're kind of cliches and again this this is a, another uh, sort of classic E blues some honey from a tree Dressed it up and they call me Everybody wants to be my baby Everybody wants to be my baby Everybody wants to be my baby now Deep River Blues. Now, Fool on the Hill is a progression that I understand from Walter Everett's book was a, an old progression that the Beatles wrote in their early years and they kept it around until they got the right words for it. And uh, it's not even, I think, in, in guitar on the record, but I still think it was a guitar composition and I think it started like this. Day after day Just a fool, and he never gives an answer. 
kind of the Beatles intrigue with the B flat and the D minor chord. Help, I need somebody help. Just anybody help. Somebody help. When I was younger, so much younger than today, I never needed anybody. that that which is so obvious but they, the way it's embedded in that chord progression it comes out as a surprise and so like you weren't expecting that the key was D yet another sort of generic chord progression in the, the zero key of this tuning the intonation of the record and it seems to be just uh, this blues that goes over this uh, constant yes I'm lonely wanna die Yes, I'm lonely. Wanna die. Well, if I ain't dead, you know the reason why. Ending. 
and that's that, that the kicker on the D string. And then this fifth, this uh, this G, where you have to jump out of the G. And that kind of brings to mind uh, Jimi Hendrix's Red House, which I think is definitely an open E minor. And then there's this uh, wonderful piece, Savoy Truffle, by George Harrison. And there he picks up the E7 sharp 9. So there's an E7 sharp 9. That's a Jimi Hendrix chord. And it, it might be that Hendrix is playing this Purple Haze. It's easier to play in open open E, or he tunes his guitar down to E flat usually. Cream tangerine, Motelli Mo, a ginger sling with a pineapple heart. using just that bar chord and driving it up the neck and it but it sounds so strong in four part harmony you're not supposed to have the chords have parallel movement with them. but on guitar that's that's a powerful state and and I think it's also very clever the way he has he's walking up the E minor this would be like Okay, so now I'm pretending this is open E minor. This is E minor. That's C. That's E minor 6. Back to the C. And then the C major 7. So that's, a, that's an example of, the, of an ascending. We've seen a lot of minor chords with a descending progression. But this is a voice leading progression that goes up. Finally, I want to play this one, and it's one of my favorites. And um, again, it's one that Walter Everett said they had this chord progression around for a long time until they got the words, uh, you know my name, look up the number which was apparently an ad for a telephone book in London and it said, you know, you know the number, you know the name, look up the number. You know my name, I'll look up the number.
I leave the E minor tuning, I want to go over the Hendrix diatonic hammer-on scale, which is a real uh, rainbow, which uh, it's a little bit easier, I think, in the open D my, open D major tuning. And so this is kind of a work in progress, but I figure this is kind of a corporate effort. And maybe if other people see how I'm playing this, they can uh, figure out the parts that, that I'm missing. guitar music accurately in tablature because a lot of people think that guitar is just too complicated to write down but tablature is, is its natural language and the thing about tablature that's mathematically interesting because guitarists don't they don't use mathematics we say they learn by ear but actually 
they, they learn the mathematics intuitively without thinking of it in a special way. But what's special about tablature is the way that you can derive the best possible tablature from any starting point. So that means that if you have some notes that you want to play on guitar, and we're, we're always assuming you can hear the notes accurately in the record, which is not always true, but assuming that you have the pitch of the notes accurately that you want to play, then you'd write the tablature in any tuning, any key, any way you want, and then under a large number of experiments that tablature will automatically converge on the best possible tablature as a terminal state. And so there are several ways that uh, like a mathematician would say that tablature is a language that you can learn from its alphabet. And the way I like to think of it is tablature is a language where you can write something and then send it off to the copy editor to fix. Of course, you're the, you're the copy editor that has to fix it, but it's still a kind of machine intelligence that you learn by performing experiments on guitar. And the experiments don't just go on infinitely finding more and more forms. The, the experiments converge on certain forms and one of the most important is the open D minor tuning that, as I've used intonated it here but which is really the 7, 5, 3, 4, 5 tuning that special number 7, 5, 3, 4, 5 and that is uh, one of the most important guitar tunings in the whole world and it's definitely the most important single guitar tuning for Beatles guitar. And uh, when I tallied this about a year ago, it's changed somewhat since then, but about a year ago I, I reckoned that you have um, about one-third of the songs in open D minor with the standardized intonation, and then you have about one-quarter of the songs, uh, Beatles songs are in open D major, and so those two tunings by themselves count for more than half of their catalog. And um, I'm not going to show the Beatles songs in standard tuning, but there are a couple, I think, and uh, Rocky Raccoon is the one that I've tried in every other tuning, and it's just uh, it's sort of an iconic standard chord progression that it, it can't be denied, and I also think Leave My Kitten All Alone is probably in standard tuning. And there, there's some other ones, and I, I think it's pretty common that there is a standard tune guitar in a lot of their records. Paul said that he learned to play guitar in standard tuning, and that John Lennon learned to play in a banjo tuning, which it's kind of obscure, but I think it probably means the open G tuning. Uh, and so Paul said he had to teach John uh, to play in standard tuning. But Paul also is a very accomplished uh, player in other tunings, particularly like yesterday in open G and uh, Baby I'm Amazed and uh, Mother Nature's Son in drop D tuning. and. Uh, Helter Skelter is an open E tuning. Um, so, if if you don't consider these other tunings, and the, the only way you can tell whether what I'm saying is right is you have to play the songs in these tunings and compare them to uh, other tunings, because if you have just one tuning, you never know if it's right. But if you have two tunings, then you can almost always tell when one is better than the other.